welcome to the Shooting the Q podcast, presented by Heath Riles Barbecue, with tips, tricks, and an inside look with some of the top pit masters in the game. Now here's your host, Heath Riles. We are back for another episode of Shooting the Q, and today we're joined with a good friend of mine, Mr. James Cruz from Louisiana. What's up, How are you doing today, James? I'm doing good, man. I'm glad to be up here in uh, northern Mississippi, south of Memphis area, and, and uh, always good to see you, always, uh, except for one weekend every May. That's, uh, that's hey, a good reminder over there, ain't it? Hey, girl. <laughs> well, you know what? You got to be good and lucky at Memphis and May. Yeah. Me and you both know it. And as good as the cooks as you can be at every contest down there, it throws that huge crap roll into it the does. mix of that many tables. And and last year, for instance, uh, I think we were .14 off of finals and point like two four from a perfect score, and we were ninth place. Yeah. And that that's how do you equate that? We won our table, but it didn't carry over. Uh, if we would have got one more like one thousandth of a point, we would have been in there. That's pretty wild. What's crazy, I was talking to one of my my right-hand guy, Charles Dabbs. you got to have a right-hand guy, right? I was talking to him about it, and, and we've almost been spoiled. We've been on a five-year run where, you know, 12th, 3rd, 1st, 2nd, and last year's our worst. Yeah, 14th, which I told the guys, if you're top 20 in the world in the most competitive division, why would you not take that? I said, I'm going to break it down for you a little further. We were one blind judge with a 9-8 overall from being top five. Like, I'll, dude, I'll take it all day. I don't know what I don't know what kind of breakfast that judge had that morning, but apparently, it, I mean, all that kind of matters. It does. All of it does. So, before we really get into yeah. Memphis and everything else, kind of tell everybody who you are mm-hmm. and what you do in our barbecue world. All right, James Cruz from Araby, Louisiana, and Araby is it borders Orleans Parish. Obviously, for you guys who don't know, Louisiana's parishes uh, to the point where if I walked on my front porch, I can grab a golf ball. Throw it across my neighbor's backyard. I'm hitting New Orleans. Well, if I stretch a little bit, I might have to go in the street. But still, I'm that close. Uh, Arab is also home of the the first ever Popeyes. I grew up a block and a half from the first ever Popeyes. Al Copeland started like a little chicken shack a few blocks away from that. So he used to drive around as, as a you know, ride my bike as a kid, go get a Popeyes a pal kids meal. And then the other side of it too is you now my the my local people are going to hate me for mentioning this. We're also known for the crawfish. That one crawfish they caught. So, for your followers, I'm about to ruin y'all's office experience because in your recipe, we'll go to YouTube and search Benny, uh, Benny Grunch and a bunch, the 12 Yats of Christmas. So, take on the uh, 12 Days of Christmas. Well, and it said, and the crawfish they caught in Arabic is number one. So, you hear it like 13 times throughout the song. It is the most annoying but most delightful song you'll ever hear around Christmas time. Benny Grunch and a bunch, 12 Yats of Christmas. So, we know for the crawfish they caught in Arabic. I'm gonna have to look that up now that <laughs> you that said up, that. We, it's a uh, oh no, your office is gonna hate you. So anyway, but yeah, it's um, not only that. So I've been barbecuing now. September first will be 27 years, and I know that for a fact. Um, and the reason since I smoked my first rack of ribs, so, uh, it was Labor Day of 1997. <clears throat> so I played sports my whole life. I was playing in the football league. This is when I was in college. I had some guys on the team, and I was renting this little double street over from my parents. I had this little beat up gas grill. The burners were all burnt out and everything. <clears throat> Didn't know anything about it. I just knew I liked to eat barbecue. Went to the grocery store, got those just beef spare ribs, and we had with no meat on top. You know, we use them for making stock. So I grabbed some of those, put some Cajun seasoning over the top, some craft barbecue sauce, all while it's raw, and just flipped it over some match light. Flipped it, flipped it, flipped it, flipped it, flipped it. I was like, it's about the color of this microphone when it was done. I said, that's what it's supposed to look like. Gave it to the guys. It tasted like the table right here. So we ordered Domino's. So my Uncle Ronnie, my dad's brother, he's always been the, the smoker of the family for like Memorial Day, 4th of July, I think, all your holidays. And I called him up and I uh, said, Uncle Ronnie, teach him how to cook some ribs. And he said, I'm not going to tell you the phone. You got to come do it with me. I'm cooking them for Labor Day. So ever since then, you know, he taught me the basics on how to, how to cook them. And I've always said this, and, and I'm a bring you up in a second for this is that was that was day one of learning the basics of barbecue and I've always said I'm always gonna be a student um from that point on I'll you know every day I'm always trying to learn learn like what is Heath doing what is Malcolm doing what's what Myron and, and Mark and all those guys doing you know how can I be better than I was yesterday it's kind of it's kind of maniacal it's it's one of the things I've got that little crazy twitch because I'm super competitive that how can I be better just because like you won that when I've got one too and it's like oh Whatever, I'm just roll my helmet out on the field, and we're going to win the game. 
no, because this guy right here filming us, he might pick up barbecue and beat us in two years. So at the end of the day, <clears throat> you brought up something a couple of years ago, and it's something that I've always said. I've told people, when I walk on the field, no one out there is going to outwork me. No one is. And when I tell you that now, some guys on my team will tell you, well, we all see that, Jenkins. I don't delegate. So I'll work myself to death, beat myself up, doing, just doing anything myself. I mean mentally I work you. So as I'm driving, <clears throat> I've got stuff running through my head, you know, and not trying to create a new recipe, just – the idea of over analyzing kind of what you're what you done your steps I right. got there I and get it I'm the same <clears> way. same way and it's and it's you're not going to mentally outwork me I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna beat you up with my head you know well, that doesn't sound right but uh I mean it, it does I get what you're saying you're yeah. winning no matter what in your head and absolutely I, and I have the mentality when I go to a contest that I have won that contest until they tell me different on the microphone absolutely. the very last call mm-hmm. and I firmly believe that I I don't bash anybody else of their beliefs right. but if you don't believe in yourself first who does you're wasting money that's and exactly time. right i mean you can spend that money doing something else you know so if i'm going to spend that amount of time and effort i'm putting everything into it you know it's it's kind of who we are now you know and and if i've been like that my whole life everything i've done um <clears throat> you know and it's it it goes back to you know it's what do you want to achieve out of this am i going to go there and waste my time and everybody else's time or we're going to try to win it. And, you know, being from Louisiana, we're not known for barbecue. Well, when you think of Louisiana, what do most people – most people don't think of barbecue no. in Louisiana, seafood. right? Everybody's thinking of seafood, Cajun-type seasonings, yeah. things like that. But mm-hmm. but New Orleans and, and Louisiana in general has a lot of good barbecue spots. Yeah. I mean, a lot. So, with, and I'm glad you brought that up because we're an outdoor cooking state, Okay. So growing up, okay, growing up in your backyard, y'all knew that family gatherings are barbecues. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's a rack of ribs, a, a hamburger. Or a it doesn't matter. That was your family. <laughs> it was gatherings. a barbecue. Our barbecues growing up, and your comments don't kill me. This was crawfish boils. It was our outdoor gathering, right? Crawfish boils, shrimp boils, crab boils. But that a was, lot of times when y'all done that, did you somebody have a grill going too for the? Maybe so, but it was still our way of you know. Uh, Somebody in the family is is the expert at that, right? They're mm-hmm. barbecuing, or whether they want to grill something or they want to boil something. We're an outdoor cooking state, and <clears throat> we're also a, a, a wildlife state. I mean, obviously, it's, it's animals have meat unless some animal is growing acorns on its back or something like that. But we, it, it kind of plays into it. I, I did an interview with um, after winning in twenty one. I did an interview with USA Today, and the guys like, so you're from the New Orleans area. It doesn't make sense. He said. You just won a world championship. How does that make sense? I said, it doesn't. It really doesn't. I said, but we're not, Louisiana's an outdoor cooking state. At some point, we're going to figure it out. And once we did, we're bringing flavor. And it's one of those things, that's how it is. We got guys in Louisiana who've won. I was on the phone with somebody on the way here. It's it's kind of like what we've done in there. It's like, we step outside of those, we step outside of the, uh, the gates of Louisiana, and we try our hand, you know, in other contests. We're bringing a little bit different flavor, but it's not, you know, here's a misconception about food in Louisiana. Everybody thinks it's burn your face off, Cajun hot. It's not. It's flavor. It's just balance. You know, a lot of onion, bell pepper, garlic, stuff like that, and a little bit of salt, pepper, and red pepper, things like that. So we bring those same balanced flavors in barbecue as well. <clears throat> At the end of the day, it still tastes like barbecue. So would you say that the Cajun influence has had a big impact on your barbecue career? Absolutely, yeah. What would you say um, – do you have any techniques that you use that you learned early on in Louisiana that you transfer over to barbecue now? Um, yeah, I would say the best way I could describe that is the fact that we do cook. We're not afraid of the season things, right? But I'm not going to offend your taste buds with too much salt, too much pepper. So even though I have, I have my process on everything, and <clears throat> it doesn't matter, this rack of ribs right here, it's, I can't guarantee you it's going to taste the exact same way Every single time. It's going to taste 99% of the way every time. But I, when I'm competing, I, I have game time decisions, right? So I've gotten to where I've cooked in the kitchen, black pot, skillets, all that kind of stuff my whole life. You always taste. You know, when we're cooking, we don't measure anything in cage of cooking. It's like, I taste, you know, put a little bit of this in there. Put a little bit of that in there. We, we cook to taste. I translate that to barbecue. Just because I'm, I'm proud of my rubs. I'm proud of my accomplishments. I take a bite. I'm like, it's lacking a little something. And most people don't give enough credit to salt and pepper. 
You got that right. I mean, What's three a, things you always reach for that was always on your grandmother's table sitting there? Uh, salt, pepper, and anyway, for us, a hot sauce. But I'm hey, It was butter, too. There you go. Yeah, you got butter, too. I mean, you think it was dish. always a butter dish it was always, on the table. Yeah. Right? And so you can relate that. And I think that's one thing why why baking up has become so much popular. Mm-hmm. Because when, when we were coming up, my grandmother had a grease strainer. She cooked bacon three or four days a week, it seems like, if yeah. not five, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And some sort, and she strained that bacon grease and always used it. Mm-hmm. And so, when you get used to those flavors, it's kind of like the butter. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people buy salted butter, some people buy unsalted butter. I cook with unsalted butter, but anything butter is going smeared oh, on is yeah. going to be salted, right? You got to. And when you look at all that and you talk about salt and pepper for barbecue, you're exactly right. You relate to things like me, especially when you can realize that judge is going to get one bite or maybe mm-hmm. two is all they're going to get. So, you need to be a little bit over that. That yes. balance line, you need to look, be a little bit salt forward. Mm-hmm. And, and at least that's my opinion. What do you think? Well, the f- salt's the first thing you taste. It's the first thing you hit your taste bud. Uh, I mean, obviously, then some of the, the peppers it hit different parts of the tongue. You just want to get that punch, though, I guess is what salt's I'm saying. Salt's the very say. first thing that hit your tongue. So I don't want these judges three or four bites in before they taste anything. Okay? So the salt is, is kind of like um, our greeter. It's like, hey, I'm here. I'm bringing you some food. Let me bring all my friends. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I've got some pepper here. I've got some Trinity here. I've got a little brown sugar. Let's bring him in on, on, the, on the back end. So, And then also we might have, you know, a little friend, a little spicy pepper back there. I so, try to describe, describe it as a sweet, salty, savory heat. Yeah. That's kind of what I, like I want. The sweet, I want the sweet on the lips. I want the salt on the tongue. I want the savoriness to come in there and the sweet to start disappearing. And I take the white and black pepper and I want it to hit you in the back of the throat. Yep. And that's the last thing it hits you. And after about three to four seconds, I want it to leave you and it be well balanced. And you go, wow, that's the best part or that's the best bite that I've had here. Mm-hmm. And that's how I try to equate to mine anyway. You know what's going to happen? I think you're probably going to mess me up on my next presentation hearing that because I'm going to talk to a judge. I'm like, I got that sweet, salty, spicy heath. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well. I, you know, I've made so many different types of presentation stumbles and things like that. Yeah, so you just keep going. And, well, and you just got to keep rolling with mm-hmm. it. And I try when I'm doing my presentation to not, it may be a little bit of laughter in it, but I try to keep everything as precise and clear and relate all that information when I'm giving a presentation yeah, to absolutely. a barbecue judge. Uh, because if they're not able to ask me a question, I feel like I've done my job 100%. Yeah. I mean, look, at, at the end of the day, we're regular people. We just put a piece of meat on the smoker. The judges are regular people. Our booth is a living room. You bring them in, and, you know, I might, first thing is, I kind of read you a little bit and stuff like that, and, but I'm not, I'm not eyeballing you like this, but you, you get a feeling, right? You get a little you body, bodily vibe from these guys. And then you're in, they're in your living room. Make them feel comfortable. You know, give them the remote, you know, and then from that point on, you talk about anything and everything, you know? Picture of your pet iguana on the wall. You want to talk about that? Talk about that. Um, That's right. You got to be able to pick those things out. And, uh, and I've always sure. been told that, like, you you hear the stories by the guys that it's just, you know, me, 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 me. Look at all this stuff. They've seen it all. You know, in, in sales, people buy from the, the person, not the company. Okay? Heath Rouse Barbecue, there's a Heath Rouse person who's also Heath Rouse Barbecue. They need to buy, that judge needs to buy from Heath Riles, not the that's barbecue. Right. Same here, and it's, and that's why I, that's the way I approach it. I want this person to become a friend of mine in that ten to fifteen minute window, you know, family, whatever. So when they leave here, we're friends. Every time I see you, we shake your hand, whatever, whatever. It's that's, that's right. my point. I don't want to be like, oh, that's the guy that gave me a, gave me a nine. Well, you know, talking about competition barbecue, that kind of led you into. Um, after you won Memphis in May, it kind of led you on the reality TV and got you on Barbecue Brawl. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that. You were on season three of Food Network's Barbecue Brawl in 2021, and you were picked first by Bobby Flay. Yeah. So to be able to be picked first by Bobby Flay, how did that feel first It's pretty off? good. Well, here's the thing. It actually aired. Episode one aired on May 9th, which is my birthday. Anybody out there? You, I got a Venmo. Um <laughs> It aired that Monday night. I left the, from Memphis the next day, so it was in 22. We filmed in, in a year before that. But uh, that was cool, though. You know, it's my first time doing, like, a national television. I've done a bunch of local stuff. And going into it, I, I was thinking, all right, in your mind, you know, we think we're under pressure in barbecue. 
put a million people watching you. Okay. A little bit different. It's, it's a little bit different atmosphere, different arena. And, um, you know, going into it, uh, they, we had a challenge where we had to do a, a one by one, well, not a one by a skewer challenge to say who you are, where you're from. And, uh, this is before they picked their, their teams. So I did a, a New Orleans style barbecue shrimp over like a char poblano grits on a skewer. Well, the grits weren't on a skewer. So these guys are walking around and I'm, I'm unfiltered. Uh, at all times, I don't care. At the end of the day, Bobby's a regular. You're guy. just like me. I'm on filter so, too. Bobby's a regular dude. Okay, so he's walking around and he looks. He sees me stirring the grits. He's like, "Grits on the skewer, huh?" I said, "Uh, well, actually, I'm sorry. I'm back up." He's walking up, <laughs> and I just, I just blurt out like on camera. It's you could, you could watch it now to this day. Hey, Bobby, I'm about to put that south in your mouth. So what did I just do? I just told Bobby Flay, who owns half of Food Network, I'm about to put that south in his mouth. Either way, so he comes up a few minutes later, and he said, grits on the skewer, huh? He said, that's, that's ballsy. I said, if my name was Bobby Flay, I would do it. So I did it, and, and since the, the shrimp they had there, I mean, traditionally, barbecue shrimp is head on, shell on, in a skillet. They had tail on, <clears throat> uh, peeled the vein. So what I did with that was I put them in a skit, I put them on a grill first, get a little barbecue flavor, then put them in a skillet, and then finished it. So when they were walking around, he uh, I could tell when he was trying to eat, he just had a look. He was like, all right, this is pretty impressive. And when he picked me, I was like, that's that's pretty cool. Because we remember watching Bobby when his boy meets grill, you know, when he was just a regular, you know, guy on Food Network and you watch him growing up and it was those early days of like Bobby Flay and Steve Reichlin with the barbecue Bible and things like that. That was our early on education before you can just log on to YouTube and watch Heath Riles barbecue videos. Um, <clears throat> those were the good old days with yeah. the Boy Meets Grill. Stack of cookbooks, you know, all Weber the and books, all that. everything. Yeah. That's so, but yeah, the experience on that w- was great. Um, you know, it's, it's, what do you, what do you think the biggest challenge was on the show itself? Oh, episode one, I, I flowed through his ease. I, I kind of, kind of proved Bobby right. Episode two, there were some challenges there. Um, the, the challenge, in my opinion, is like it, it, it's not about you. <clears throat> Even though you're competing against that, that season, eight other not comp, uh, contestant overall. So I, I was competing against eight other, eight, other, eight other people. But the challenge, you also have to rely on a team of members that are also competing against you. So think about that a second. We're competing against each other. We're on the same team. Do I really want to help James out? Do I really want to help Heath out? <clears throat> you don't want to sabotage. You still want to win as a team, but there's – there's strategies, there's there's techniques and everything like that, but th- the challenge is try to try to play within your own game. Try to you know, cook what you know, you know, and, and try not to do anything crazy or anything. And I never did anything crazy, uh, but the challenge is try not to let it let it get too big, right? Um, you know, you got all those people there. You got Bobby Flay. You got all these celebrities <clears throat> there and everything. It's like at the end of the day, they're regular people. So don't think of them as, you know, some TV god. They eat, swallow, and dispose of it the same way all the rest of us do, you know? You, you got that right, so, for sure. Well, if you had the opportunity, would you do another reality TV show? 100%. Now I have expectations of what, what to expect when you go in, which is zero expectations, you know? that's uh, I, I know what you mean on I that. went in as a favorite to win that show, and it's it doesn't always work out for the favorite. Uh, but I appreciate every, every minute that I was on air is, you know, I got a lot of airtime, <clears throat> um, but I would, I would 100% do it again. And if they called me up and said there was a redemption season, I, I would I would pretty much believe I'd be a lock for it. So uh, in case you guys don't know, I didn't win the show. So <laughs> so it was a good time. I would do it again. Well, you know, your competition barbecue kind of led you to that. Mm-hmm. What, what made you get into competing into barbecue? Um. You have enough friends and family telling you stuff's good. Uh, we don't have barbecue contests at the time. We had maybe a handful a year, a year, and this was probably 2006. I would started cooking it in barbecue in '97. It was just friends and family, <clears throat> the holiday barbecue, right? And you got enough friends and family telling you it's good. I'm like, well, let me try my hand at it. You know, if I, yeah, they're telling me it's good, I'm, I should win this easily. So my cousin Matthew, well, uh, cornbread crews. Um, he's gonna love that. So, uh, he said, man, let's, let's go do this contest in Laurel, Mississippi, the American, uh, cancer society barbecue throwdown at the fairgrounds. So we went out there, we did it. I took first place in ribs. 
this is easy. Like, this, that's my baby, right? Uh, this is I'm gonna dominate everybody for for like my career. Bob and the other ones. We left there like let's find another barbecue contest. Well, let's just say we bombed ourselves. <laughs> we we were I mean that was terrible the next three months. I couldn't get a call, couldn't figure anything out. That first place rib I was like I can I need to make it better. You don't change recipes after you do well. You, you hold on to them, but um, and that led to like all right if I really want to do this I need to get better. <clears throat> And in that 06 range, there, again, there was no YouTube videos. No, you know, Google was just really website. getting hot. There's yeah. nothing, yeah. And then I just started hanging around some other teams. Uh, made a couple of trips to Memphis and May, and watched a bunch of cutting boards, and and learned from some of the best. Um, then eventually, I went on my I went on my own as my own being my own head cook back in 2007, and then I finally found say some IBCA contest in Louisiana, and. That kind of got me started. I did a couple IBCA, then I went back to doing, I got to get involved in KCBS, and some NBM with some other teams and stuff there. Um, and that just eventually led to the fact that I like a challenge. I'm not going to find one style of contest. I'm like, that's it. I'm a BCA cook. I'm a Kate. No, 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 no. I want I want to try it all because every one of them is a different challenge. Every one of them makes you cook differently. So you become more well-rounded. And then eventually you start kind of figuring things out, right? You, you, stop, you stop loading up three trucks and a trailer worth of stuff to cook three or four pieces of meat, you know? Been there and done that plenty of oh times. Oh, my God. You spent three hours just packing up. Packing and unpacking and carrying oh. so much unnecessary stuff. God. And now I tell people you need to learn to cook out of a bus tub mm -hmm. or a Yeti Go box. Yes. And if you can't carry everything in that, you, there's a problem. Yes. Because simple is better, and if you'll force yourself to it instead of going out and spending all this money on all this stuff, you'll yeah. appreciate it later on. Absolutely. So, I mean, that, that just – and eventually I got better and better and better. And then uh, one of my first grand, I was like, holy crap, this is good. You know, either I got lucky or I'm a pretty good cook. And then uh, that just, it just escalated from there. And man, I, I just, um, you know, it just because, like I said, just because I won, you won one. I'm, I'm not satisfied. You know, I've got, I got people on my team that left the team and said, well, you know, we won already. What else do we have to prove? I mean, it's kind of like barbecue's kind of oh, like NASCAR. Right. You run what you brung, mm. but also, you know, there's factors that go in it. You don't know the quality of meat you're cooking. You're trying to source Absolutely. the best quality meat, but you don't really know. You're talking about that rib, right? Mm -hmm. You do everything the same, and then you get to that rib, that piece of meat that you picked up, and you cook two side by side. They're going to turn out different. You don't know if <clears> that hog was treated the same its whole life, if it was processed the same, if it was under stress when it was yep. actually processed. You don't know any of this. Uh, I've had whole hogs that you could cook for 30 hours, and they never got tender. Right. And you explain that to me. I've had two of them hot my entire life, and then I, I don't get it. Right. Just never would turn loose, and it had something to do genetically with that. that Absolutely. Every piece of is different. Every piece of them. It, and we could order the same brand of ribs or hog or shoulder every single time. And when you open that box up, they could hand pick it. When you open that box up, it's like you still don't know until it starts cooking. It might look identical. You get clones of ribs. Well, and like you said about the judges as well, That's you don't know variable. what that judge did on that Friday night. You don't know if they got drunk. You don't know if they smoked cigarettes before they judge. You don't know if they cleansed their palate. So many you variables. don't know any of this. There's so many variables right. that go in it. And here, here's a question that you probably get all the time. When people start figuring out that you might be pretty good at barbecue, right? And they want to ask you, what's the time and temperature? <laughs> That's the good on, on time and what, temperature on what, what temp are you cooking at? That's what I always ask. What, somebody asked my finished tip, well, what are you cooking on and what temp are you cooking at? And they're like, why are you asking me that? Because every cooker cooks different. The pellet grill is going to cook different than the drum. The drum's going to cook different than an offset and vice versa. You the, can go all the way the around. The air that it's bringing in is different That's every right. time. And I tell people all the time, the meat tells me when it's done. Okay? Now, I'll go ahead and tell you this. My thermopen is my babysitter. It, it'll tell me I don't temp ribs. It, everything, it, it doesn't matter what section of the body. And people go watch me. I'm teaching a class this weekend, and I'm going to tell these guys, I've got 10 thermometers right here. My 10 thermometers are different than yours. I can give you a guideline what to look for, but I it's hand-checked the entire time. Do you time use heat me. gloves under your rubber gloves? Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Oh, you see. I'm a dummy, and, and anybody can vouch for me in here, and if you've been around and cooking uh -huh. and seen, I will burn my hands to the point that sometimes I used to keep cold water where I could stick my hands in them yeah. really fast if, the, if they was that burning me up. Right. But I like to be able to feel that rib, and yeah. I agree with you. I use a thermopen to a point. 
But so, then it's like, I need to feel this rib. So that's why I don't wear heat gloves underneath. Right. I need to do that, my little, what I call a push-pull test on the I call it on the bones. I just take one hand. And if I can take one bone and hold it and the other one, and I can see it wanting to come through that yeah. meat, I know that's where it needs yeah. to be. I don't even need to poke in it anymore. Yeah. And it, and you, when you cook enough racks, that's just something of it. You can pick a rib up and kind of hold it in Feel the middle. A bit. I still and you look, test, if you start right. seeing that line create on top and yeah. it starts saying, you know that's where it needs to be. Yeah. It's just certain certain little tricks that you've got to cook enough and get comfortable enough and confident enough. There, like I said, with, with ribs, though, I wrap my ribs, I'm talking about just the foil alone, a certain way so I can do a quick check. I said, unwrapping the whole thing, now you're losing. So attention. you ends first and end the sides, or you I'll sides exactly and then the ends? I'll tell you exactly what I do here. Two sheets of heavy-duty foil, ribs are down, right? Belly out, out in, left, right. I don't do the curl test, all, all that stuff, because to me, that's too much work. I agree. Okay, I'm a, I'm a trap. I'm a I trap fold monster. only. Yeah, so, and the reason why I go, my first fold is belly out, outside in, left, right. So my quick left, right, I'm still not losing heat, right? I can only I only have to unfold that outside part. All I all I see is bones exposed. And I can start working with those and then fold it back up. I don't have to unwrap the entire thing. So for me, I want to keep as much heat in there as possible so I don't lose some of that that thermal momentum going. All right. So I want to open it up, real quick test, back on the smoker. How Indonesia. how do you when you come to wrapping your ribs, let's just say Memphis in May, for instance, uh, how many racks do you cook? I buy twenty four, cook twenty. Cook twenty so three cases. I think last year I cooked twenty one because it was twenty one years since. Yeah, somebody, you know there what you I mean. Go. I had that figured in my head. Yeah. I cook twenty one instead of twenty. Uh -huh. And I'm in that same boat with you. Uh, you know, I used to cook sixteen, but I like that other four. Mm -hmm. And when you get ready to wrap, what's your process? Do you um, get all of them off the grill, or only a certain amount, like three or four at a time, I'll, to wrap? I'll, I'll tell it. I'll tell anybody. I've always said this. I, I'm not. I'm not putting dehydrated dragon tail on my stuff. I, I'm an open book, I, I, and and. I'm, it's a super simple process and recipe to do. I keep it very because I want to taste like barbecue. So at the end of the day, I cook in a vertical smoker. I have four shelves. Each shelf has five racks. Okay, my rib selection goes the night before, the day before. I have my ones and twos. Ones are ones I think these are these are the, the ten best. Then I have my other ten that are still really good because I remember the old, other four racks. Uh, when I start picking them up, there's four racks that I'm just not going to cook. All right, I'll either give them to the guys, put them in the ice chest, take them home. Uh, sorry, but some of them hit the trash. I don't have time for that. Um, I, I wrap. Well, first off, I rub five at a time. goes on smoker. Five, five. Okay. When I go to wrap, I've got my guy, Charles, pulling off. I'm at the table. I'm the only person that wraps. I'm telling you, again, I don't delegate. I oh, I'm, I do the wrapping myself, too. I know how much I'm putting on his ribs. I know what all I'm doing. So as I'm at my table, I've got – Guys holding napkins or foiling because I rip a piece, just whatever. Got a couple guys on the side. He's coming off the trailer, and he's bringing me the whole cooking rack off, set it down, and I, I go one at a time. So I do five at a time because the amount of time that they're off is the same amount of time that the other ones are lacking from that one in a sense, right? We rub five, put them on. So you got five minutes before the other one. You got five minutes after the other one coming off. So That's a good system. Yeah, so eventually they're all getting roughly the same cooking time. Like you're open and closed, and you're losing heat, but – in my mind, it's they're all the same cooking time, and um, eventually, though, some of those racks that, that I thought early on during the trimming process are raw. I'm like, eh, that's we got to hit the twenty racks. Kind of, it kind of some of the some of those have hit the box. They've worked their way up. They earned their way in that smoker. You know, they beat all the others. They made the box, and uh, I I could tell you right now, when I won, I had some number twos in that box. Did you do you stagger your ribs for finals at Memphis no. May? I don't either. No, so that became that became a little bit of a uh, I'm gonna go ahead and call it the, the the crime mentality of some of these teams who didn't win. Right? It's never their fault. So in 21, when I won, uh, we had that that scoring glitch. I was on the river. Our booth faces the river. <clears throat> but next thing you know, we had just finished uh, prelims. Uh, no, actually, we weren't finished prelims. We turned in blind. I had one judge uh, walking up. And all of a sudden, they said, no, we, we – what I think what ended up happening, and someone correct me if I'm wrong in comments or whatever, I think someone forgot to turn in scores and just completely threw the whole system off. So they had to kind of, like, kind of redo things, so delay things. So I'm like, well, now we're holding ribs. I had my ribs – I mean, the, my rack for that judge all all glazed up, everything garnished, and it just sat there for, for an hour. Like, we can't use it now. 
you can't even you can't even reheat that one because it's already sauced. It's like, well, that's one rack down, you know. I've already cut through my best racks for the box. Edit that out. I don't want people to know I put my best box, my best ribs in the box. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so uh, now it kind of threw us for a loop. We finally get judged prelims like an hour, hour and a half later, and there's another delay. So now we're right next to Kendall Adair, and we're all out, you know, on the sidewalk. Everyone, everybody starts checking Facebook, all right? Anybody made finals? Because that's where everyone was supposed, all right? Congratulations, I made finals. Nothing. Two hours later, three hours later, nothing. Everyone's like, what the hell is going on? So finally, they decide that the cart's coming around. And uh, we see it coming, like, maybe it's us, maybe it's not. And really, I only cook one time. My ribs are off in that 1030 range in the morning and they're they're done. They're holding they're holding cambros. And um get the uh the certificate. My finals presentation was at seven ten at night. Okay. Seven ten. I didn't realize your presentation was that late that night. I've got a picture of it. I'll send it to you. Seven ten at night. Now it's the sun was still up and that kinda helped me. I, I'm gonna give you a quick little story how it helped me during finals because we have an open door that sun was setting on the river. So that sun was coming directly in. I'm not going to wear sunglasses with these four judges. So my timekeeper greeter, he's standing right there blocking the door for me. <clears throat> he's giving flashes for times. And, uh, you know, you, you go to the, the rib wiggle and all that stuff, right? He stepped aside. He let, the, so- he let the sun hit the rib. And I'm going to tell you right now, uh, Chuck Averwater was one of my uh, judges that year. He looks at he's like, the guy just did you a favor, didn't he? I said, yeah. I said, I looked at I was like, I almost dropped him because I was excited. These things were like... Look like the red on that neon siren. They were just beautiful, and it's, and we all kind of laughed. It's, it again, like we go back to what we said earlier. It's a very casual setting. These guys are going to tell you whether you're the best in the world or not. That's right. But they're still in your living room. We can all you can cut up and joke and everything. These are four friends. So I held that rib up. I'm like, dude, that's that's pretty cool. We ended up finishing the thing and everything. But yeah, that year was that year was crazy. And um, I like holding ribs. I think the longer you hold them, the better they get and, if you keep them hot. Yeah, and, and what's crazy? They can stay warm. So people on social media have oh, they, all these other teams are cooking twice. They did. I'm like, I kind of said I cooked one time. I held my ribs for eight hours for finals. Be the same way. Yeah, uh, I mean, oh, and here's one other thing too. I present on the same smoker I cooked on. So I got to hold ribs, which now not really hot anymore. How do I get them hot? when the smoke is already completely cooled off, wiped down, cooled off. We're not that team that rolls out a brand new smoker pulling blue tape off of because I don't think that's impressive. I want my presentation smoker to still smell like barbecue. So we happen to have just another grill off to the side, like, dude, fire it up. Let's, let's, let's finish this ribs right there. Fire it up. It, uh, it might have been a drum or something like that. Let's just put them on there real quick, and that's what we did. So we still had a pretty hot rib for the finals judges. Good. We cooked one time. Well, what, what's the biggest changes you've seen in the competition barbecue world in the last five years? Um, education, more competition. It's not like we can go out there and just, you know, if you've got some experience, you're just going to win easily. Uh, we've got guys. Um, we got a guy in Louisiana, Josh Michelli. Uh, the name of his team is Italians Do It Better Barbecue. <laughs> really cool guy, but he's the kind of guy. He's, he's, he kind of reminds me a little bit of, of me kind of coming up. It's education first, no matter what, right? You taste something like, let's say I've, comp- let's say I, I met you for the first time and I tried your rib. I'm like, all right, I need to try, I need to get there, I need to get to that level. He's that guy. So with that being said, let's go back to like say your videos, Malcolm's videos, anything you can find online. These guys are getting more educated now. So where before it took us five years before we can figure out how to do anything, these guys are learning six months to a year, and they're saving a lot of money doing that. I think that's where it is. Now Now it's more of a level playing field than it used to be. A lot more competition. Um, and it's not as easy, you know, and, unless you're working like me and you are. I don't work as much anymore. I will say that about myself. I don't – I go out and I compete in South Haven Spring Fest before Memphis May every year. And last year I usually go to Murfreesboro every year in September, yeah. but I couldn't go because of Ace Hardware Trade Show last year. And I don't think I'm going to be able to go this year. I'm going to be out of town. Yeah. And so I'll just end up cooking two this year. I'd like to try to catch one in the fall, maybe October. And after cooking Houston, I definitely want to cook some more IBCA or BCA style contest. Yeah. I really like that, you know, one brisket, the whole but rib you're, and a but piece you're of chicken. You're mentally preparing for Memphis and May. Yeah, Leaders. I mean, I, I'm it's not. The big, it's the big boy. I mean, I'm I'm kind of I'm getting ready to gear up to drag my big pit out and do mm-hmm. a few practice runs. 
Um, and when I do a practice run, I cook 16 to 20 racks, what I'm going to cook at Memphis. Yeah. So the smoker runs the same. I try to do all that. When I, even though when I go to South Haven Spring Fest, um, and I could get by with six racks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because the way everything is with me in now, mm -hmm. I cook 16 to 20 racks, a full run, everything the same, because I don't want to get off of that pattern going into the big show. Right. And, uh, you know, talking about Memphis in May and all that, how do you feel about the move to the river, off of the river to Liberty Park? Um, when I first heard about it, uh, I saw it on social media, and I was like, oh, what the hell's going on? And then um, <clears throat> the first thing people outside of Memphis heard about was the music fest was canceled. I was like, all right, well, that's not happening. But we had heard that they might have had some – Struggles, whatever. I don't know any details behind that, but that was canceled. So, well, that's that's part of the month long festival. <clears throat> and then you start hearing rumblings about about uh, Memphis and May. Then we were told that, I mean, me correct me if I'm wrong here, that the contract wasn't going to be renewed. That they were going to have to find another location, and that just threw flooded comments for people. Where's the best location? Well. We didn't have a bad time two years ago when you wanted. I mean, obviously, you're, I mean, I you had a good liked, time there. I mean, honestly, from a standpoint, I like Tiger Lane. Um, I like all the pavement. I like the ambiance on the river. Yeah. I think it's awesome. But for – I've helped organize festivals before in contests, not the Memphis and May magnitude. Right. But you can just imagine um, doing what we do for a living barbecue mm -hmm. contest. You've been to plenty of places – Logistical wise, it's a nightmare downtown. Oh, yeah. There's no better way to describe it. Especially last year. I mean, yeah, it, it, especially last year when they opened the park back up and the sidewalks are narrower. I mean, the dirt hadn't been graded too much right. prior and put sod on top. So when you go to back in 25,000 pound trailers off of the sidewalk, you know they're going to sink up to the axles. <laughs> and, and that's not Memphis and May's fault. They've <gasps> done the best they could do, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I hope the other contest does great. I think they've got 60-something teams. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a lot of money for sure. I would love to be there. But my commitment kind of lies to the world championship. I you mean, winning, winning that one trophy right there, I mean, just like you, you want to go back and get another one. Mm -hmm. And I really wish the other contest wouldn't on that same weekend so we could support it too. Yeah. Um, hey, I yeah. hope that they all later on come to some kind of understanding and work something out. I mean, I'm I'm for the sport in general – and I'm not trying to pick sides. I just have to go and to here's Memphis. Thing. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk bad about the other contests. I'm not either. And and at the same time, being a competitor, they're in my peripheral. You want to? I want to keep yeah. an eye on that contest because you don't know what's gonna happen with Memphis and May. Well, you know, also know Memphis and May. As time goes on, things change eventually, and it's time for Memphis and May to make some proactive changes toward the teams. Yes. I mean, we've all seen how festivals have to change and adapt, right, especially after COVID. Mm -hmm. And if they are moving to the river, I mean, to the uh, Tiger Lane over there, I think they need to figure out. I know they didn't this year. Uh, but if that's going to be the permanent homes, they're building hotels over that way and everything yeah. else. Lodging is an issue. They, right they need to figure out fl traffic flow. Team spaces need to be bigger, allow teams to – you know, they're just – You've been to the American Royal. You pull mm -hmm. up to the gate of 600 teams. Yeah. Oh, your spot's number 36. Go down here and hang a right in that lot. That's which lot you're in. You'll find mm -hmm. your space. You're good. They're, they don't – it's it's no bull crap. All right. And Memphis and May, you have a lot of egos. I like a lot of people down there. But you have a lot of egos that think that, oh, if you're six inches over, we're kicking you out of the contest. I mean, you've run into that. And I'm not trying to nitpick Memphis yeah. and May at all. But that. they they have got to chill out on some of that kind of stuff. Is not uh, at at the end of the day, we're all coming to town to do them a favor. That's exactly right. They're an organization that wants supported, and I think they need to listen to some of the people. If they don't, I wish them the best. I mean, I'm still going to support them and do the right yeah, thing at at a world championship. But uh, again, I'm listen, I'm gonna keep an eye on it, just because you don't know where it might be one and done. Memphis and May might carry them. This might be the last Memphis. We don't. No one knows anything. We so don't know nothing. You got to keep an eye on that one as well. And then, uh, you know, for me, preparing going into it, I was like, I'm, I ran into uh, Tuffy Stone and Chris Lilly at the Shed event, and I was talking to those guys, and, and Chris leans into him. He's like, all right, James, tell me where you're going to be at in May. I said, I'm going to be at uh, Tiger Lane. He said, all right, good. Because, and that was, that was one of those things where it's kind of like, you know, once you've been successful out there, the other guys successful, they want to compete against you, okay? 
I don't want to go out there and know, and know that oh Heath Rousen's there. He's he's chasing the other one. I want to go out there competing against the best. And I'm feel like you, James, on that. You see it. You don't see it as much now. But when the points chase gets down in KCBS or NBN, either one, mm-hmm. and there's dual contest on the same weekend, you see teams split off and go to different places. Yeah. And back when I was competing, I never done that. If there was dual contest on some weekend, I'm going, where well, you going? Yeah. One of us is coming out on top. Yeah. Hey, I ain't going to avoid mm-hmm. you. One of us is coming out on top. Right. And I mean, look, you, there's some good teams going down to the river. Who, but I'm, I'm, Do you know any big-time cooks that are going to the river versus the world championship? Like somebody's won Memphis in May before. Yeah. I, I don't, Hog addiction. But he had Marcy. won Memphis in May before. Marky, yeah, I who, can see Marky Who's Marcy on – uh, yeah. Home team. I um, can see Marquio going there though. He's on a roll. Yeah. Um, why it, not? It it fits what the direction he's. He's a he's a hell of a cook. He's a hell of a cook. And he's a really good he's a really good Memphis made cook. And he's actually a really good presenter too when you get to talk to him. So with that, but yeah, he I know he's going down there. But um, he don't. I guess the reason he's going to the river, he really don't have a reason to be at Memphis in May. I guess specifically like. I'm not trying to say nobody's better than him. Right. I mean, he's a hell of a cook. Um, but I think it fits people's narrative differently. I know Will Hare, yeah. his sponsors, wanted to go to the river instead of there. Uh, I respect Will. I mean, wishing the best. Mark Yeo, um And I know there's several NBN teams going down there because of the cost factor. It is. I mean, all of Some that. Some teams are splitting. Yeah. Doing both. I wish that I had a big we, enough team. I can do that. We can't do that. <laughs> well, first off, I can't, I can't do that because I gotta be in, I'd have to be in two places at one time. Uh, but no, but like, so, so him, he, he had one of the best years ever in NBN coming up. Why not finish? How many did he win? Uh, I want to say he won 11 total. That's including seven straight. That's pretty impressive. 11 grands. He won 11 in NBN. And seven straight within that. Yeah. And I won nine straight one time. That's impressive. So why not, why not cap that season off with the big contest for them? So, um, you know, so I wanted to be, I want to be where the better teams are because at the end of the day, let's say I go down to the river and let's say I won it. You know, I'm still going to be looking down the road. I'm like, what could have been? I could have had another one of those because, you know, it's crazy is, um, you know, when, when you won at 22, you put a lot into going into that con. You cook 300 racks. I know my competition. You cook 300 racks going in. What's funny is I don't practice at all. I don't cook one I rack. I practice a lot. Yeah, I don't, I don't, pra- I don't, and the reason why for me, I don't want to second guess myself. I haven't changed my rib recipe in almost ten years. It's the exact same process from start to finish, other than the game time decision. Well, so that 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 rib down there, I developed that rub to go down there. For yeah. That. So I'm gonna tell you this. I, I haven't mean, told you this. I, yet. I just I done something totally different. And this year I'm gonna practice. I probably won't cook three hundred. No, <laughs> that's a lot. I'll cook a hundred and something, no doubt. Between now and Memphis so, and May, I'll cook one hundred fifty. I haven't told you this yet, but um, going into that year, and then I knew you you cooked three hundred racks. I was like, he's coming in ready. And then when I saw the three of our uh, – us two, and then uh, who was the third finalist? Smoking with attitude. Smoking with attitude. When I got the sheet, I looked at it. I was like, all right. I said, uh, it's going to be a tough one. And I said – in your mind, you start game planning, okay? Because, like I said, we're coming, we're coming off of winning, you know, final in the previous two years, and that's our third straight final. We're, we're a good rib team. But you start game planning, okay, because now I'm competing against you, okay? The rib itself – we all know that's our worst racks of the day for the most part, or close to it. Okay, how can I beat Heath and those guys? And then you start thinking about something. You start assuming what would be Heath's strength in this. Um, and then on top of that, but you don't get away from your game. You still do what you do, right? But at the same time, you know, it's, it's like football, right? You watch film all week long. And you play the game. So that hour of time, I'm, I'm mentally watching film on Heath and the other team, like, what advantage do we have over those two teams? Okay, um, we know that we cook what we we cook what we we cook. We're hard to beat. But I know you came in with some momentum coming in and, and everything. So once finals were over, I remember I came and walked to visit you in your trailer, and um, I think it was just me and you talking. I was like, "All right, dust settle. Let's let's see what happens." And I'm gonna go ahead and say this on what you got like 28 million followers. No, I ain't got no bunch of followers. I knew I lost. I know I lost to you. There was what some, makes you say that? There was something about it. Um, when we're talking, there was something about it. I I knew I had a good rib, 
you were probably the most calm I've ever seen you, and we've known each other for years, the most calm I've ever seen you ever in a trailer that day. It's kind of like you knew, before anybody, before anybody assumes, he didn't know he won ahead of time. No, I didn't. But what I'm saying is I just knew you were so confident in what you did and your final president, and what you turned in, you were calm. I was like, I, have no, I mean, whether I'm third, second, or first, you were that calm. I was like, I just lost to this guy. I just, I just hand. Well, oh, there's, there she is again. Oh, that. I mean, I, I'll tell you, I take a different mentality though, James. Yeah. I really do, especially at down there. You know, you can never count anything until it's said and done down yeah. there. And no matter how good you are, I have won on tears on the MBN and yeah. won uh, fifteen contests in a year. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and then go win five KCBS on top of that. Yeah. And so when you, you know, those kind of numbers and going into Memphis and May or going to a big thing, you think you're just going to plow in there. Mm-hmm. And you got to get lucky. you got to hit the <clears throat> right table. And right. rib is the hardest category in Memphis and May. I've said that for years. And, well, you, I'm not knocking whole hog. I'm not knocking pork shoulder. Well, you can pork shoulder for a is box the dominant hog. category. Yes. By far, it will beat a rib and a hog. Most days, especially depending on who's presenting it mm-hmm. and if they cook it right, yes. a whole hog is going to be a rib and a shoulder depending on who's presenting it and if it's cooked right. But a rib, just a lonely rib, you ain't got them a lonely rib. You're not serving any other parts out of it. Mm-hmm. There's nothing to do. It's a loin back. You're chancing of how thick that loin was, if it's going to be dry, if it stayed moist. Mm-hmm. All that plays into a factor. It's, I mean, it's a harder entry to, to cook perfect. I respect a, a man more in ribs than I do in the other categories. And I will say that on mm-hmm. camera publicly, ain't nothing wrong with whole hog, whatever, but rib is freaking hard. Well, there's more tedious work. You're more active during the cook. Um, and you got a piece of meat that's this thick. There's, you know? <laughs> and there's also no way you can really do anything. I'm just going to say cheat on a rib. It's impossible. Right. So okay. nobody can bash you behind your back and go, well, he done this to get there. You can't do you shit. You can't hide anything. You can't do anything. You can't do anything. Nothing. That, that entire entry is in front of that judge. That's right. A hog, uh, you know, maybe the, maybe this loin's better than that. You can pick and choose. That's right. That, you're, everything you cook well, you take is that right loin, there. You, you nailed it. You can take the loin. I'm not saying nobody done anything wrong, but you can take that loin and taste the center part of that loin, and it may not be as good as the, the roast end up by the shoulder. Yes. You taste it and go, I don't know. Let me try the end down here by the hams. Oh, that's what I really need there. That That's what's going in the box. Now that I don't have the entire that with a rib. Yeah, right. I don't have that with that rib. Right. It's, you taste it and go, well, I got four more racks I can taste. Which one's? Which ones is going? Which nine bones is going in the box or yeah. whatever? It, so, it's it's definitely a. Uh, I just feel like rib is so much harder, and for John David to finally pull off that rib win. Uh, that's he he's on the. Uh, and speaking of him, you took, everybody talks about the uh, Bill Belichick coaching tree, right? Wheeler has a rib tree. I'm one of the branches on a rib tree, and every, and you got to give him respect for that. Lambert's been my overall mentor for years, but the fact that when he won that last year, I was like. Competitive side was like should have been me two years ago. Not joking, but when he won it, I was like, "That that's awesome. That is friggin' awesome." For me, you know, when when I'm not gonna sit here and say when somebody else wins something, I don't go, "Damn, I wish I would have done this or I'd have no. done that different." When John David won, I looked at my wife and other people standing around me, and it may be on camera somewhere. It couldn't have happened to a better person. Now, I know John Dalton. Cooked that rib that morning. John David wasn't there. John Dalton put that rib on, done all that him and Shane. John David sold that rib. And you're right. John David, his barbecue tree of the people he has trained to cook yeah. and, like, helped out. And I can remember John David didn't know me from Adam when I moved up here and just meeting him and giving us tips and tricks and me calling him up and going, man, I really need to borrow an old hickory smoker, a rotisserie. I got 80 bucks I need to cook. Come get it. He has never once said – I ain't got it for you, Heath. You know, John Davis, the guy that's always had three or four of those things. Well, go over to Chad's house and pick it up or go over to so-and-so, and I might have to clean it first. Might have to fill the propane bottles up. You know, but there was always something available to help you with your calls with John David. And in Operation Barbecue Relief, John David's one of the main ones that got our Operation Barbecue Relief kind of up off the ground, especially in our area here. Um, and, it, I mean, and – Going in partners with Melissa Cookston and Pete in the Memphis Barbecue. A lot of people don't realize that. Mm-hmm. John David has really cultured in the barbecue mecca, and in my opinion, he should be in the Hall of Fame. So here's my 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 thing on that, right? And as far as your your people watching and my people watching as well, who don't know this guy, 
doesn't do classes, and he, not because he doesn't want to. His classes are one-on-one conversations. He will tell you everything. Yep. He's not a TV guy. He's nothing like that, but he is there, – there's a guy out of Texas they call the Godfather Ribs for years. Will is the Godfather Ribs. We all know that. Um, and – he will take you under his wing. It doesn't have, it, he can meet you the day before and, and teach you everything. And then, um, and what he's gaining out of that is, is almost nothing other than a little pride for you, you know? That's and, right. And, you know, so that, that's the biggest thing. And it's like, you know, I keep, keep staring at that trophy over there. And, and, you know, I've got, like I said, I've got a third, a first, and a second. And then every year you look back, you know, go back to that. What keeps me coming back? What makes me go back to Tiger Lane is the fact that a second should be a first. That third should be a second, which should be a first, right? And what's crazy is some people ask me, well, how long are you going to stay in ribs? Because people who really know me is that I'm actually a hell of a hog cook. Uh, won the national championship and also won three straight hogs up here. I came, again, come from Louisiana. Came up here, won three straight up until Arlington. Arlington in the uh, fall, I think I was like six or seven. Arlington, Arlington and Atoka is always two really good contests in our area here. Both yeah. of them usually – Atoka seems like it's a big kickoff, right, of the spring, and then Arlington is kind of the fall ender yeah. around here. Yeah, I won Hog uh, in Arlington uh, in 22, and then uh, last year I think I was like six. So my thing is when I when I when when people ask me, how long are you going to cook ribs in Memphis and May? Because I like – they think, all right, we'll take the easier route, go to shoulder a hog. And What would you go to hog, next at Memphis Hog? 100%. Well, 100% cook hog. And I think I would go to shoulder. Well, back to shoulder. I'm going to tell you why, and I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to share a little vulnerability here. I don't ever present a shoulder. I don't know all those parts. So um, could I learn it in 15 minutes? Yes. But hog is the other thing. It's like, you know what? Ribs are my baby because I like a challenge, right? But hog is my – and people are going to think I'm dumb, dumb because, like, well, why haven't I just gone done hog? Hog's my easiest path to winning overall. And uh, I've always said, well, look – I'm going to give myself a goal, win ribs two to three times, and then move over to hog. Um, How many hogs is it supposed to be at Memphis this year? 20-something, maybe, teens. Makes me wish I'd have cooked hog. 20-something. Hog shoulders only 20-something, too, this year. <laughs> ribs are only 60-something. It's small. So, with mm. with that being said, uh, Chuck Averwater told me, he said he did, he did bring up something to me. Um, he said – you can go to Hog, and he said, James, I know how competitive you are. You can take the easier route out and go to Hog. I'm like, I'm not saying Hog's easy. I mean, these guys have cooked Hogs their entire life, but compared to a rib to get to the top. He said, or you stay in ribs. He said, you've been one of the hottest teams in the last handful of years. Um, done stuff that's never been done in Memphis and May for a kid from Arabia, Louisiana. You know, right? He said, well, stay in ribs and maybe try to work your way up to maybe be the best rib cook to ever cook out there. Try to win it 10 times. Like, well, hell, like, let me get to two first. So he said, but stay out there and just try to dominate that division for years in the most tough, in, in the, the hardest, most competitive, toughest division at Hawks, at, at Memphis May. And uh, I said, well, yeah. I said, why do you have to challenge me like that? Because now now you, get, you probably added five more years of, of I mean, that's kind of why I went to rib, James. I'll be honest with you. I didn't want to depend on anybody else to help me cook. And I knew at the end of the day I could go down there and cook a rib and I'd have to have a huge team. And you, and I've been on huge teams. I've been a part of them. Have run them for years. And I don't want that. Too many second opinions too. It's too many. It tries to be too many cooks in the kitchen. Too much stuff. And I'll tell anybody, my name's on that bottle for a reason. I got the final say at my booth. Yep. I not a corporate sponsor. Not nobody. I am the sponsor. Yep. And and I just like it that way because being in the business, we can do things our way. Yep. And also. Being in the business, why I like cooking a rib at Memphis and focusing on rib, everybody's not going out to buy a whole hog cooker and going to cook a whole hog at home. Yeah, Everybody's not going out to buy a whole product. You can't even buy a whole pork shoulder at the store the majority of the time. You've got to source it. You cannot get one to Louisiana. So you see my point now? I'm not saying I'm one-sided or not, but the majority of people cook ribs at home Mm -hmm. or they want to learn how to cook ribs or pulled pork. And nothing wrong with that. It was either one, but I'm going to stick to the ribs. I like ribs. Right. It's my thing. Uh, yeah, it's nice winning that first place trophy at Memphis and May, but that's not what it's about for me. Yeah. I really enjoy that four hour cook time. Yeah, that's that's the, that's yeah. the the whole mecca is I can do my work before cook four hours, put out a really good product. It, it and wraps you up. spent twenty hours into your craft cooking a hog, not you in general, but 
and to be able to compete against you and maybe come out on top, I feel like I've done a better job. Absolutely. I it's mean, it's again it's it's tough and it's you know, uh out of the twenty five hog teams, how many can actually win it? That's what you gotta ask yourself. All right, but I, I mean know. we can both go down But out of the rib teams, how many can win that? That's right. So it's a higher percentage. And I, that's why I want to I want to compete against the best. I want to I want to beat the best. I want to be amongst the best. When if you went down that whole list of sixty something rib teams and twenty something shoulder teams and twenty something hog teams, how many people do you really think combined total, let's just say out of a hundred, can really win Memphis in May? Ten. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Ten. I agree with you wholeheartedly so, on that comment. So here's my thought: that one compares to one down the river. Why wouldn't you want to be amongst that ten? That's me. I want to be against the best in the business and not saying nobody's not the best in the business is going do, to the river. Do I want to not. be amongst the hundred and put a lot of prize money in my pocket? No. I want to funnel it down. I want to be amongst the ten best in the world because when you think of world champion, you think Memphis and May. The Royal is prestigious. The Jack is prestigious, but that's a lottery pick. The, the Houston Rodeo is a great event too. But it's Memphis a crap May, shoot. Memphis and May is the one. It's the most prestigious world champion. You think barbecue world champion, you think Memphis and May. So why wouldn't you want to be part of that 10, that elite 10, and hopefully year in and year out, be part of that 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 fraternity of guys, right? Well, the way and I look at it. all become family, too. You're right. You're all come family. The way I look at it, I may not win it, but they sure go know I was there. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I try to tell everybody. Yeah, so. And, you know, so talking about Memphis and May, that leads me really into asking you, are you doing any other competitions besides Memphis and May this year? Got a, I got a big one coming up. Well, that was my next thing. You do yeah. have a huge. I don't one have any. Up. I don't have any between now and then because my focus. Well, let's, I'll tell you what. Let's talk about that contest, and I'll tell you the reason why I have a focus going into it. Because if I tell people what the focus is, well, tell us what the contest is. Okay, so we're evidently talking about hogs for a cause, yes. which is a awesome event, and it has turned into one of the biggest events that New Orleans puts on. Correct? Yeah. I mean, I think it will be before it's over with. Yeah, as far as attendance. Yeah. Yeah, it will be. I mean, and I unfortunately have not been to Hogs for a Cause. You got an open invite if you're ready. Uh, well, I would love to be there. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, but it's that first weekend of April, and that's my daughter's birthday. So that that's – We could sing her happy birthday. Man, the wife has already got everything planned out, and I think and, I would be – And we could put her on stage. You know, that would be awesome, but <laughs> not at two. Not at two. We won't be able to do it. Maybe when she's six or seven. Oh, that's true. Yeah, she is. But young. at two years old, I don't think my oh, wife would no, fly no, no, for that. No, no, we, no. We, it's an event there. So. Yeah, my little princess, she's going to get to do whatever she wants for so, sure. So, hogs for the cause, okay. The biggest thing we've talked about, like you just touched on, barbecue contest, right? It's it's bigger than that. And I don't mean. Well, it's raising money for pediatric brain cancer, yes. so it has a huge cause behind it. Yes. And there is no prize money, no. correct, James? All Zero. the money goes to pediat pediatric, pediatric brain, brain cancer. cancer. So it is pediatric brain cancer is one of the leading causes of death for, for children. Hogs for the Cause has turned into the premier, the leading fundraiser to support pediatric brain cancer. Um, and we, we both know this. And, and I'll, I'm going to go a little off for a second. You know, before you have kids, you always hear about once you become a parent, your mindset changes, right? My son's four and a half. You you got two, you got one. You have two. an eighteen year old and a two. almost so two, two year old. So in your mind, being a parent, not not a barbecue guy, not, nothing else, just a parent. You think of you never want to find out your kid was ever diagnosed with that. So you feel for these other parents and stuff, and so you want to do everything you can to help out. A dollar doesn't cure cancer, and everybody knows that. Um, our biggest thing is we need to raise money to help the these the parents and the family kind of take away uh, help out with the financial burden of of dealing with this stuff the medical expenses, um, because I, I don't I don't know the medical term behind it but if you're stress free if you're happier it helps with healing okay so that's part of what, what we do there so the idea is to raise money for these for these families send them grants just to help them out you know and if we can help them out a little bit us putting a piece of uh, meat on a smoker. That does not. That does nothing other than being a part of the event. The idea for us is we're going to send these kids grants. We're going to build a hog's house. So there's one in New Orleans. Um, it's kind of a high end condo uh, setup and everything. So in the past, these families would would come in town to get uh, treatment for their kids, and they would have to find hotels or stay with family. Now this is a, a nice, comfortable place for them to stay in for free um, while their 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 child is getting treatment. And so that's another thing. 
another stress-free thing for these kids. So for us, it's our duty, not just for one event a year, not for one week in a year, but all year long going into it. Uh, so my team, we try to do things to kind of raise money for these, these, these kids. And whether it be I'll do a pulled pork pop-up at a grocery store, I'll do some online fundraising, things like that. But you change your name for – Fire and Spice. Fire and, and Spice. Started out because, you know, we go to what I do for a living. I'm in the spice business. So I was like, all right, well, there's the, the spice part. The fire part's the barbecue part. And the reason why I wanted to go with a separate name outside of my brand and my own, my own company is because it's not about me. Okay, and I'm going to bring on other friends who cook with me. I'll bring on you one day with us. Um, and we're a collection of friends and, and competitors all with one focus, okay? And that's first and foremost to raise money for kids. Um, and then to try to beat each other in barbecue, the other guys out there. But that's the other side of it, too, is and at this event here, um, last year we, hit, we raised collectively $3.6 million. There's 96 teams on the grounds with a waiting list to get in. It's an NBN special event. Uh, Melzy Wilson runs judge and all that kind of stuff. Um, all 96 teams are also vending. Unlike any other contest, you know, how many times you had a contest somebody walks up, how much is a hot plate? Get away from me, right? Every team here vends. So I separate my team. I got my competition guys in the back, and I have friends, family, whoever selling food. Uh, they've got a POS system, and every dollar there Goes to, the, goes to the kids through our team. So do you cook the same thing you cook for the contest to pass out for samples, or do you do more chef-inspired stuff? You can or? if you want, but we do something different. Um, we get a little creative with it. Like, I'll take – my hog comes off. It turns, in, I think, 930 to 945. I'm only building a box. There's no blind there. I mean, there's no on-site. So we'll take that hog and give it to those guys and have them pull it. And I think this year we're going to do, like, a whole hog stale crack of pastalaya. We call it, you know, world champion stale crack of pasta light, and that's gonna be scoop and serve for the public. So you're gonna get a high end competition hog mixed into a pasta light. So you're it's gonna, gonna chop it all up. Let them chop it up, and they they deal with it. Uh, so with that being said, um, you got all these teams here, all doing their part to raise money. This year we have a goal of five million, which is insane for an event that's like 15, 16 years old. Wow. This is year ten for me, and um, you know, you got you got guys like uh, I'm gonna tell you who's on, Two other cooks on my team, okay? And I'll give you a quick rundown. Uh, Lambert, part of my team, again, he's back. Wheeler is part of my team this year. So you got a team, you got myself, Wheeler, and Lambert on one team. You got Charles Dabbs is my right hand guy. You got Josh Michelle, you guys talking about earlier today. Um, well, I've seen Nikita that. White, um, who else has got well. a team this year? Is it? Oh, it's loaded. Moore's not year. out, three taxi guys. The shed. And the shed, yeah, they've got a team. Got I a thought team. it was somebody else too. Uh, Craig Carter. Yeah, Craig Carter. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Four, four people. So all of us come together, and, you, and we touched on Wheeler earlier. Wheeler, if if he is charity first, barbecue second, you know, if you ask him right now, pick one, he's going charity. We all know that. So he he's part of the team. We all know that we all want to raise money. I mean, he texted me the other day, hey, help me finish getting set up with this online fundraising thing. So there's two parts to uh, Hawks for the Cause that are some of the best feelings in the world there. It, it feels good to win a barbecue trophy on stage, and it's the most fun award you'll ever go to. It, it's a party. 30,000 people in the crowd. You don't see that at most barbecue contests. That's Houston. It's over 100. <laughs> oh, okay, well, uh, in Louisiana. So there's two parts. I'm gonna, I'll tell you this. There's two parts of the hogs that remind me of why I'm there, okay? Uh, the cooks meet on Friday afternoon. So you got a representative from every team. So you got hundred people there, plus a few of their friends and family. They can drink a beer. Mills is up there talking about, hey, guys, let's fill the box, all this stuff, going over the rules. Then towards the end of the meeting, they'll bring, you know, one of the parents up with one of the grant recipients, one of the kids. And then, you know, you're, you're, like, you're, you're used to speaking every, every week in front of a digital audience everywhere. So you become a speaker. Put a parent in front of a microphone in front of 200 strangers and, tell, and have them tell you what hogs means to them. So two years ago, there was this one guy, um, you know, he comes up and, you know, he hands him, he's got the microphone, he's looking around. He, don't rush him. You know, let him say what he said. He, he's he standing on the microphone for about over 30 minutes. His daughter was in a wheelchair and, and just, you know, she can't smile, no reaction. And he was just telling us a story that just six months prior to that, she was singing, her name was uh, Kaylee. She was six, she was singing, dancing, being a normal little six month, a six-year-old uh, kid. So now she's, you know, she's wheelchair bound. She, she can't do anything. So to him, he's pouring out to us. 
the reason why all of us are there, you know, for people like this. And um, I could tell you right now, there were, Will is a big guy, right? Picture a handful of guys like him. You know what it is. And Which are probably all, tears running, I mean. Let me tell you, there was not a dry in that crowd. The other part of Hogs that's it's great, too, is at awards. Awards, I feel like, last over two hours. It's it's fun. But there's one aspect of awards. When they start doing the fundraising award, um, you can go into it all you want as a barbecue guy. Like, I'm ready to win some barbecue awards. But then all of a sudden you start hearing the main reason why we're all there. <clears throat> we're all there is because you start hearing the fundraising dollars. They call it, like, top 20, top 15. And, like, maybe 20th place raised $25,000. There's a team called Florida Q, okay? They haven't really won anything in the barbecue side, but they're, you know what? They're the real champions there. They'll raise over half a million dollars by themselves. Dang. Okay. So they, they're like one fundraiser 10 years straight. Like the second place fundraiser team will raise like 300, 400,000. So you start hearing these numbers and um, you start realizing like, all right, dude, it's, it's, the, it's the real reason why we're here because now it goes back to you, you know, being a parent again. And it's kind of like, you never wish that on your on your child, right? But at the same time, we're a thirty thousand member family, so we all did our part there. I've been on a stage as a fundraising team, and I'm gonna tell you something right now because we had a really good year two years ago fundraising. When you're up there, and there's a bigger applause for fundraising walks than there is any other part of the contest, and that that is single handedly the best feeling. I've ever had walking the stage of Hogs, and I've walked it every year. Last year, I had a down year. It was my first year. I've never walked the stage. I finished 14th over, 12th overall. Um, but every year, I've walked the stage in one, two, multiple categories. But that one single walk was the the best feeling I've ever had ever at Hogs because you're up there amongst these guys that, look, they're not worried about the barbecue trophies. We're all there for one reason. And then, and then you know, to touch on the barbecue side, though, it is about as stacked of a field as you'll ever see at oh, any I'm barbecue sure. contest. Yeah. So everybody has to turn in a whole hog, correct? And yeah. that's the only part of the contest there is just a whole hog turn in, that's it? No. You have ribs, shoulder, whole hog, and pork puree. It's an interesting fourth category. So it's, it's an NBA contest, but they added the fourth category, pork puree. Anything you want to turn in where pork is the focus of that entry, right? Uh, scoring is 10% of uh, overall score is fundraising. The other 90% is three out of the four categories. They'll drop the lowest score. Let's just say me and you are there competing. Um, what if our rib isn't that good? Pork puree will carry it. Rib gets dropped. So 90% of the score is, is the actual barbecue. So all every team out there is cooked. Well, not every team. You can you have to cook at least three out of four to qualify for grand. Uh, we cook all four because you've you got to give yourself a fighting chance. So uh, with that being said, you've got 96 teams all cooking this. And a hog's first turn, and then shoulder, then rib, and then I think pork puree in line. And then um, there's some other ancillary. There's like a wing ancillary, Friday night, bacon, and mayo, and there's a handful of other stuff. But uh, the, the teams are, like you said earlier, something about uh, locations. Uh, hogs, your location in the field is based off of previous year's fundraising. If you win grand, you get the first overall pick at the plot draft in, in January. It was the weekend of the shed event. Uh, you can pick anywhere you want in the field within your booth size unless you want to get a bigger booth. If you're 40 by 40, you want to go 60 by 60, you get first pick in there, with the exception of two locations at Hogs. Out of respect to the two big fundraising teams, the flanking stage, you don't take their spots, okay? So you get the first pick in the draft. After that, it goes by fundraising within your plot size that you signed up for. So we're 40 by 40. We didn't have a very good year fundraising last year, um, so I knew we wouldn't get a very good pick and a four by forties, and there's four quads. Everybody wants to be in quad one for fundraising because that's the music stage, awards, all the crowds there. Quad four, and when you first walk into the fields to the lower left, there's no stage. It's kind of quiet. So I was at the shed, and I got a text. I said, James, you saw where your plot is? I said, no. I said, I was just going to let somebody in the crowd. Pick. I was going to be one of the last few picks anyway. And they sent me a picture of the map, and the way it just happened to line up in quad four. Quad four is, is legit this year when it comes to cooking. So you walk into the little pathway right here, and you start in a cor- one corner. Kendall Ladera is cooking for a team called Three Pig Mafia. And there's another team comprised of some guys from Texas, like Joey Machado, uh, Manuel Moriano, those guys. And you have another guy, a guy named Jason Gonzalez, really good friend of mine. He's not a barbecue competition guy at all. He's a one of the best traditional barbecue guys that I know out of Louisiana. 
But he did take third in hogs last year because if he's there, he's going to try to win. And if you ever go down to hogs, he's, he's got some. I'm going to have to get down there one of these days. Okay, look, then there's, a, then there's a path. Then there's hog addiction. Then there's us. Then there's the shed team. And then there's U-Bonds. So you got a row of seven teams in a row that. Well, everybody kind of knows everybody. Dude, five out of seven have Memphis May experience. Well, that'd be good. Dude, so we're all right there with each other. We're all well, going to have a good time. Well, where can people donate at if they want to donate to the cause so, and to the fundraiser and so all that? So how it works is every team fundraises, and every team gets credit for fundraising. So my team is Fire and Spice. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll send you, like, the QR code or link. You, you post it on your social media um, and ours as well. If you don't follow me on social media, I'm at James Cruz. It's C-R-U-S-E. And I'm posting right now this time of year. That's why I led up to a point. I said, let me tell you what I'm prepping. The next month. My focus is Hogs for the Cause. No other barbecue events, nothing. Um, and if you follow me now, I mean, you follow me, you'll see me start posting. I'll post like a flyer with a QR code and a link. Now, when it comes to donating, uh, the most important thing is the fact that every dollar counts. I don't care how much money you have. It doesn't matter. Um, you get on there, and there's some quick buttons of like you know, 25, 50, 75, whatever. Um, there's a custom button, a custom uh, thing right there. Look, Right now with today's economy, not everybody can afford to come out of pocket and donate for everything. Um, so there's a custom button on there. If you could donate, if you just want to donate five dollars every single dollar, I would rather a hundred five dollar donations than a wait around for five hundred. You know, because that means all hundred people have good intention to raise money for these kids. That's right. So you can get on there and you can do a you can do whatever amount you want, a dollar on up to two hundred grand if you want, okay? It doesn't matter, every single dollar counts. You could donate as a you know as a person, okay. You could donate anonymously. Let's just say you don't want your name on the list of donations. Click the button; it just says anonymous, five dollars on up, whatever it is. You could donate as a business. You do that as soon as you hit submit, you get your five one c three paperwork sent right back to you. So anybody could donate, and then on top of that, that's pretty cool. They have it segmented out like that. Yeah, and here's the other crazy part about it: it used to be just you know, uh, credit or debit card online, or you write a check. Two hogs for the cause, maybe put Fire and Spice in the memo at the bottom. Now they're taking Venmo, PayPal, uh, Google Pay, Apple Pay. I think at this day and time, you have to take everything. There's no reason why nonstop. If you can, if you can afford to, uh, to donate a dollar, send her, send her over. Just follow my social media. I'll, I'll give you a link. Well, to it we'll as well. put all that in there. Well, yeah. the last big thing I have for you is, you know, you come out with your rubs back last year, yeah. stockyard landing. Year Was ago. it last year? Or year before? A year ago. It hit the market. Uh, so January first. Tell us about your your rubs and your plans for the future yeah. and kind of yeah, all so that. I uh, I mentioned earlier, so uh, so I'm from Araby, Louisiana, okay, proudly from Araby, uh, Uptown Shellmet is is what I call it. Araby's first original name was Stockyard Landing. Its first settled name was called Stockyard Landing. It was home of all the the, the stockyards where all the cattle processing was in Louisiana. They come down there. In fact, I talked to the St. Bernard Parish uh, historian. I'm from St. Bernard Parish, Louisiana. And he told me one of the last bits of legislature that D.C. needed to write what we now know as a monopoly was when the stockyards closed in Araby. Wow. I thought that's kind of cool, right? Because everybody had to get their stuff done down there. And then, um, so that's kind of cool about, about Araby. Uh, and Araby is also, is, it was home of the That year. is pretty cool. You paid homage to where you live. Yeah, so, so out of those three, which one are your favorite? Oh, my. Uh, so I've got my chop house, which is, you know, salt, pepper, onion, garlic, bell pepper, celery, and a handful of other things. It's it's very versatile. As far as when I compete, let's say Memphis and May, it's all around. I'll tell everybody exactly what I do. This goes on the night before. It's an all-purpose barbecue rub. It goes on everything. Great on chicken. I mean, that's amazing on chicken. But it's also my base rub on rib, shoulder, and whole hog. And then a grand champ, this one's a little bit on the sweeter side with, like, a little bit of a chipotle kick. And... You know, this one is that just savory all-purpose barbecue rub. Um, the Chop House is the one I feel like has been – I get I get tagged more on social media people using that one because they're putting it on baked chicken veggies, and we talked about it earlier today, that uh, that's the one that – look, at the end of the day, I'm selling a product. Which one is your favorite in your pantry? I'll sell you two of them. You know, you want to buy one, I'm going to sell you two. So whatever – I kind of keep that same motto. I yeah. mean, everybody has their favorites. And, 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 and the and, crazy part about it is so – a lot of people don't know what I do for a Everybody thinks I just barbecue all, you know, 28 days, uh, 28 week, uh, days a week. No. So I'm, I'm the, uh, I'm a deep, I'm a co-packer. So I'm a national co-packer of Deep South Blenders in New Orleans. 
And um, so I'm actually also a customer of the company. So we blend my stuff. Uh, we blend a whole bunch of other guys, some very notable social media guys as well. And then we have our own line, our own retail line. It's called Cajun Land. So, well, y'all are in a lot of stores with your Cajun stores. Land products, yeah, and so y'all have some really this, good good. This is stuff. actually the new packaging for the boil now. It's now in a printed bag. Wow! It used to come in a four pound jug, and that's yours. Um, even though uh, I'll definitely try even, this out and do some boil. With even it. though even a crawfish feels like it's a two hundred and twenty eight dollars a pound right now. But uh, I so did it, eat crawfish last weekend and shrimp, and I will say I paid. They were cooked, and I paid ten dollars a pound. That's not bad. I mean, it's not bad, and that's, it's a uh, uh, that's cheap. It's Mister Making More. He was a uh, um, sheriff's deputy, and he was over South Haven many years. Yeah. He has Memphis Crawfish Company here in town. Yeah. he's got several trailers, but his his trailer's right on the road here on the right from my office, and yeah, so they have really good shrimp, uh, sausage stuff like that. Uh, he even had some boudin. He yeah. brought back from Louisiana. Oh, boudin's good, man. So, so it, uh, it's pretty wild. I said at the end of the day, so this is you know for anybody interested in coat packing, that's what we do. We we. Rub season, and we're a 52-year-old family-run, uh, oldest, largest family-run co-packing in the New Orleans area. Food capital of the world. We, we need a new seasons, right? Man, New Orleans is known for that food, I can tell you that. Yeah, That's one so, of me um, and my wife's most favorite places. Yeah. And I do have to ask this question for you before we wrap up here. Have you ever ate at Restaurant Revolution? Uh, no, but I'll tell you this. I was watching a podcast uh, earlier today, and before I came here, is some guy named Heath, is it Heath Cat, Heathcliff? No, he's Riles. I watched his podcast earlier, and I swear, this guy must be sponsored by Revolution. Candace was talking about it. It was I haven't really been, good. I haven't been yet, but you sold me today. I mean, I'm going to tell you who sold it. it to me was uh, Rochelle sold it to Candace and Malcolm. Her and Malcolm went. Yet. And they said, hey, look, if you go anywhere else, you need to get a reservation here. And we had to take like a 5 o'clock reservation because that's all they had. Right. But I'm here to tell you, it was. Is that good, huh? I. It was that good. It's hard to go wrong with many restaurants in New Orleans. You got that right, but that restaurant does it right. I, I mean, need the turtle soup was absolutely amazing. Yeah, you. I, I mean, mean, y'all described it. And then y'all had some uh, um, quail eggs. Uh, yes, we did. We had deviled a, quail eggs. Deviled quail eggs. I mean, man, it, it it was an upper scale restaurant, but the food was just like incredible. I you don't get that at a lot of places. You I know what I mean? I haven't been yet, so. Here's my question. Part of your, uh, your your title of that podcast, you mentioned Saints game. I got Saints season tickets. I mean, we, we're in the dome that same day. I didn't know that. Bears, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next so time the, you come in town. The label company that, that we do labels with actually has a suite there. So they invited us down, and that's how we wound up there. And that was my first time at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Well, that, and I I've really got, liked that, that old school stadium. I've got another invite for you then. Apparently you're an Ole Miss fan, right? I am. All right, go Tigers. Um I'm part of a big tailgate at LSU a couple times a year. And if this, I know they're moving the schedules around this year, but if it follows suit, Ole Miss will be back at LSU this fall. Y'all frying corn dogs? Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> had to do it. Oh, had to no, do no, it. No, I had no. to do it. So I, I, do I know it. I'm scheduled to do this big tailgate probably with uh, ESPN. I'll probably be there for uh, LSU uh, Oklahoma. Um, a couple years ago, it was LSU Ole Miss at LSU, and it didn't go well for y'all. No. <laughs> and uh, I, I had cooked for uh, the Marty McGee show that morning, and then uh, later that day I did SEC Nation with you know, Tebow. That dude's neck is this freaking big. Oh, I ate bet. half the brisket that I cooked. Well, that was a cool setting. But if I think the schedule – I don't know if the release schedule, I'll have to uh, check later. But uh, if, if Ole Miss is playing at LSU this year – You have to let me know. You got let's, the invite, man. Work. Come do some cooking. Uh, I'd we, like to do that. That'd be pretty cook, fun. We typically cook something that, that caters to the other team. And I got to meet uh, these two ladies, two super fans from Ole Miss. Uh, I, I mean, nicknames might be Hottie and Toddy, two older ladies. They're they're in just full-on get-up, and I've got pictures with them, these sweetest ladies there. Have you ever been to the Grove at Oxford? Uh, I haven't, but I heard it's one of the most beautiful campuses it's, it's in the pretty, country. It's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. Yeah, it really so, uh, is. Yeah, well, so look, we could keep talking all day, James. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on the absolutely. show. Absolutely. Kind of tell everybody where they can find you at online, and we'll be sure to get that link up yes. in this podcast here if anybody wants to make a donation to James's Hog for a Cause team. So yeah. I so think that's totally the, awesome. Look, the, quick, the quickest avenue for me, just just find me on Facebook and Instagram at, at James Cruz. It's C-R-U-S-E. It's, you can't miss me. I'm, the, the ugly little picture of me wearing a hat. Uh, and then from there, you, you can lean into my stock in Atlanta and stuff like that. And, you know, because I'm always posting about that as well. But, uh, yeah, just follow me on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, Facebook, I have to delete somebody, but you can follow. Uh, Instagram, we'll get there as well. And if you have any questions at all, 
about hogs, about my products, about, you know, if you're, you want to get your stuff on the market, send me a message. I reply to all of them. I don't, I ain't like some of these people who have social media managers. I am, I am the manager, the, the dishwasher, the employee, and the janitor. So. Well, James, thank you for coming on. I appreciate, I appreciate you for it. coming on Anytime, and shooting the key with us. Absolutely. It's always good to talk a little barbecue yes, with somebody competing in a different uh, area than we are and talking about their success. So, yeah. again, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having and me. And I appreciate it. Appreciate you. Thank you, man. Thank you for tuning in to the Shooting the Cue podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions for future episodes, please feel free to reach out to us on our social media channels or through our website. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. Leave us a review if you enjoyed the show. Until next time, keep shooting the cue.